good afternoon, everyone. First, you know, thank you for having me. Um, I, uh, I'm Bernard Schmidt, Vice President of Automation Innovation with the JTA. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak to you today a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit about the ultimate urban circulator and um, our efforts around the U2C um, and uh, also kind of connect that for you um, with what we've done and what we call our test and learn program, how that all comes together and all the efforts that we're doing around automation innovation. Um, this presentation um, can be somewhat lengthy, um, but what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to I'm going to go through some stuff pretty quickly and try to leave a considerable amount of time to have um, your guest uh, Alvaro ask questions. I think that it might be more fruitful to have a discussion. People might want to you know ask about different things, and so I'll try to give you high points, um, but just know that there's 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 quite a bit there's quite a bit there. Um, so first thing is, you know, the, the U2C, what is the U2C and what is the journey? Uh, the U2C stands for the Ultimate Urban Circulator, and it really started out with the problem of what do we do with our existing Skyway? Our Skyway is an automated people mover system. It's an eight station, two and a half mile system. And, um, you know, many people uh, many years ago called it the Skyway to Nowhere, and it was about kind of you know, tear it down. Um, the problem is that the Skyway was, had a lot of federal investment in it. Um, the FTA put money in it and, you know, it had a 50 year useful life and the Skyway is only, you know, now it's about 33, 34 years old. And so, you know, part of how, you know, uh, the color of money and how that works is, you know, even though city officials, politicians and constituents might say, you know, I want to rip it down, um, you know, the feds see that see themselves as an investment and say, well, if you're going to do that, you know, we, we want our money back. So uh, I think we convened uh, under the leadership of Mr. Ford and the JTA board at the time, you know, put together an advisory committee. And what you see here is a little bit of the chronology that's led to, um, you know, kind of the formation of the U2C and, and different projects under that program. But it was really, again, about what to do with it, because the APM system is one of three pilot systems. It's a very unique system, and it hit various states of obsolescence. The, uh, you know, Bombardier no longer manufactures that vehicle, all the switches, all the parts. And so even though we're keeping it operational, we do a lot of effort in retrofitting and bubble gum and tape and, and, and engineering just to keep it up and running. And so the, the decision was made not only to keep the Skyway, but to expand it. Um, and really lean into emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, and expand it. From there, the JTA applied and won the bill grant. Uh, we were one of three bill grant uh, recipients that year. Um, you all might be familiar, uh, prior to bill grant, it was called Tiger. Uh, Build was more focused on innovation and infrastructure, and then now it's called Raise. <clears throat> and so we won that bill grant. Secretary Chow came to Jacksonville at the time under uh, the previous administration and handed JTA the check. We did not get all the money that we wanted to do the entire project. And so the, the, the bill grant funds is now appropriated to the first phase or the first project under the program. And I'll walk you through that here in a little bit, but, but you see a little bit of where we're at now to the point that at least on the first project, the RFP is completed, it's underway, and we start substantial construction in about two months. So, Again, what, what is the U2C stands for ultimate urban circulator. What I want you to see on the right side of the slide here is that, you know, from looking at the Skyway modernization, what to do, um, we really kind of broke up the U2C into three, uh, three buckets, three projects. You have the first one being the Bay Street Innovation Corridor. Uh, that is the first phase of the U2C program, the first project. I'm going to show you what that looks like. It's a little, a little over three miles, 3.1, 3.2 miles. It is all at grade surface level um, deployment of autonomous vehicle, all in mixed traffic at this point. The second phase is the Skyway conversion. It actually will connect between the two and convert the existing infrastructure. A big part of the conversation that we had with the bill grant was, again, our ability to really speak to the fact that we were repurposing existing infrastructure to get the entire useful life out of it. And then the third phase is these neighborhood extensions. And so what you see here is how we start out with the orange 
you know, in this existing skyway. And we start to really develop these tentacles that starts to really connect the various neighborhoods throughout Jacksonville, San Marco, Riverside, Brooklyn, the emerging medical complex. And the entire system is really anchored east and west by JRTC, the Jacksonville Regional Transportation Center on the west side of, of, of the city. And on the east side, you know, anchored uh, and really the, you know, uh, terminates at the Jacksonville Jaguars TIA Bankfield Stadium. Um, so it's also a unique project for us in the fact that, you know, we have a transit system, an autonomous vehicle transit system that will actually provide service um, and end up uh, going to an NFL stadium. And so, you know, with all the, the, the river enhancements and development coming downtown, um, we really see the future of, you know, and the need for putting in, you know, this kind of transit system and infrastructure uh, ahead of ahead of town. Um, you know, Jacksonville is probably one of the last, um, you know, waterfront, underdeveloped waterfront cities in the United States. It's really going through its boom right now with a Four Seasons coming, a new Museum of Science and History. Um, you know, there's just cranes everywhere. And so all of that waterfront is being developed. When I talk to you about the Bay Street Innovation Corridor, this is what it looks like um, along that same map. And what you see here is the green is the existing Skyway system. The blue is the first phase, is the Bay Street Innovation Corridor. And so that first phase is essentially one of the tentacles um, that you saw in the animation and really starts to provide that connectivity east and west throughout the entire downtown core that we don't have. Why? Because the Skyway was never built to its fruition. And so, you know, what you see here is in the first phase, we provide that connectivity. The next phase will actually connect the two and convert what you see here in green into that roadway at elevation. Now, here's what's unique about where the JTA is at. We are the only transit authority in the United States that has such a massive mega project like this that has associated funding with all three phases. All three projects, the Bay Street Innovation Corridor is fully funded. It's a $51 million project. It's fully funded and underway. And the service launches in 2025. The Skyway conversion, two years ago, the JTA campaign um, and got an extension and expansion of the low option gas tax. We, we happen to be funded here by a gas tax, which means we get six cents of every dollar that you spend in Duval County on gas comes to public transportation. Um, and so we have the right per state statute to take that up to 12 cents. And not only did we take it up to 12 cents and that got voted on, but a portion of that got dedicated to different projects, not just JTA projects, city projects, public work projects, but a big majority of it came to the JTA. In fact, that second box, that Skyway conversion, has dedicated funding to the tune of $246 million, a quarter of a billion dollars, okay? Now, are we sitting on $246 million in the, in the bank account? No, that is over 30 years. But what it means is we are setting ourselves up for a really interesting P3 and trying to set up a real public private partnership where we can actually put this project out for bid where the private sector will front up the, you know, front load the cost and take annuity payments uh, for the 30 years, you know, of that quarter billion dollars. Now that, it's still left to be determined if that's the final price tag on the second phase, because it's really more of an engineering construction project. Um, I really believe it will be a little north of that, but right now, dedicated funding already to the tune of 246 million. And then on the neighborhood extensions, JTA received also some grant funds to start the planning um, and looking at doing some of the T-car studies and such on, on the different extensions and routes that we are exploring. So on the, on the second phase, the Skyway conversion, what I'm sharing here with you is when I talk to you about the uniqueness of the Skyway system, you know, most people are used to the APM system being just really the monorail. Um, we have the benefit of our Skyway went through multiple phases um, early on. Um, it was actually built as a roadway at elevation used with a rubber tire vehicle. It was retrofitted in the late 80s, early 90s with that, that center uh, guide rail. And so we have the unique privilege of looking at how we really just remove that center guide rail and return the superstructure, what we call the superstructure, essentially back to a roadway at elevation to be used with a, with a rubber tire vehicle as well. And so 
uh, what you see here is we've already done the engineering analysis that shows that the foundation, the substructure is, is sound. In fact, the APMs, the actual trains, weigh so much more than any particular AV that when you're removing that and removing the center guide rail, you are returning that substructure, the foundations, really to its fit form and function, and it can handle the load that we're going to put up there, okay? And so the strategy that you see on the left the only difference between the strategy between the strategies across all the the, the, the three phases, we really had a, a, a strategic approach in keeping it all the same. And so the only difference is what you see circled there in red, which is the only difference between the two uh, the, the the three projects is really the funding and the different infrastructure and miscellaneous requirements. But for the most part, we were very strategic in the vehicle design, the IT cybersecurity, the policy and regulations and such in terms of really setting up. So for example, on our, even on this first procurement on the base innovation corridor, the vehicle requirements are such that we limited the size of the vehicle and the AVs in, in with the thought of them riding on the elevated structure. Even though at grade and at street level, you can put an autonomous bus, we will not, that was not part of our requirements in terms of you know what we wanted to see go up on the guideway. And so we've already started to look what this means like across the operations, this track design, the structure, the construction, the stations, all that work is already done. We have some more work to do to probably take it up to about a 30% design and then put it out for a full P3 RFP. But that is what is to come in that second phase. Many of you might ask, you know, what is it gonna take to connect the two between the elevated guideway and, and the roadway at elevation? And what I would share with you would be, it'd be something like the simulation you're seeing here. We imagine through a series of ramps that you would probably, you know, st start out at elevation and be able to really ramp, ramp down at grade. And when the vehicles get to at grade, just continue upon their route, um, whether they're on a dedicated lane or mixed traffic. Now, we prefer dedicated lane for a multitude of reasons. It's not um, uh, really anything to do with the technology. Um, it, it does provide a little bit uh, additional safety, but it's really about really getting you know, that that fast pass and really enhancing what public transit is for, because if I have a, an autonomous vehicle that can seat, you know, 15, 20 people, that's 20 cars that I get off the road. But if but if but if we try to put it in that mixed traffic, you know, you, we then become our speed becomes indexed to 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 the rest of the, the traffic. So this is kind of the, the same philosophy on BRTs and, and trying to have um, um, TSP, transit signal priority and other things that really give public buses, public transit, a real a real fast track. And so we're still working um, with, with the city of Jacksonville and, and other stakeholders on, on, on that. But today, our project will be in mixed traffic. Um, we do have particular lanes we will operate in on the Bay Street Innovation Corridor. But in our second phase, that elevated guideway is our right-of-way, 100% our right-of-way. And so only the vehicles that we allow to be up there will be up there. So it's primarily going to be just our autonomous vehicles. But you can imagine from a revenue share uh, point of view, we could, you know, uh, it could be an opportunity uh, in the future to allow our good friends at Amazon uh, to, you know, ride their autonomous vehicles and use our elevated guideway to go ahead and move product or, or do certain things. So there are a variety of different things uh, that, that, that come about in terms of, you know, how this system is set up. And so, you know, this, this brings a really good transition because, you know, how did this all really come together? Um, and, you know, part of how it, it came together was first and foremost, you know, uh, I, I should share with you all that it's a true testament to our CEO, Mr. Nat Ford, the board of directors of the JTA to really invest in bringing, um, you know, and bringing this in-house. Um, what many of you might not know is I'm not a public sector, public transit guy. In fact, prior to the JT, I was an executive with Amazon. I brought Amazon to Jacksonville and ran a large, what they call large AR robotics, Amazon Robotics Fulfillment Center um, here in Jacksonville. But, you know, once Jacksonville won um, uh, this money to do this main, you know, uh, a very, what I call a very sexy project where the rubber meets the road, um, I came on board. But you know, I think Mr. Ford, you know, really uh, empowered me. I brought over another, uh, other people over from Amazon. I had um, uh, a gentleman who works for me who's who's a robotics expert. I brought people in from automotive 
Um, I brought in uh, our own electrical engineers, our own mechanical engineers. And so I share that with all of you because a lot of public transit agencies really vend out a lot of their work and really depend upon consultancies. Um, and I can tell you, you know, uh, when I first got here, I kicked the tires and I was handed all the big in the cards, all the acronyms, you know, H and T B, blah, 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 like all of them came. And, and, and I think they're really good at what they do. But a lot of what I found out is, you know, hey, they, you know, we wanted to do a workshop. We wanted to, you know, speak to the experts. And a lot of time they were asking me the questions that I wanted them to give me additional information on. And so I think part of it for us has been a mind shift of bringing a lot of that in-house for us. And so we really started to figure out as, as public transit, as operators, as people who move people, um, the JTA and some of you all understand what it takes to move people as we do it on a multitude of, of, of platforms. We operate a ferry here in Jacksonville. We have BRT, we have paratransit, we have B-side buggies, golf carts, um, and we have an APM system. So we, we, we operate and move people on trains, on buses, on small vehicles, large vehicles, and, and so on and so forth. And so we understand the requirements of ADA. We understand the requirements of the FTA, USDOT, and such. And so it really became important to figure out how we're going to convey that in this world where all of the vehicle manufacturers and all the other folks here were really startups small startup organizations that really, you know, their approach was ADA means I need to give you a wheelchair. No, it also means hearing impaired. It means seeing impaired. It means a whole lot. And so we needed to kind of get to that. And so that's what really learned led to us getting to our test and learn facility. Uh, and so the JTA test and learn facility, believe it or not, it's full circle was actually purchased to be a park and ride to service the Amazon facility that, that I ran down the road. Uh, and so it is, it is a full uh, operating um, hub. And uh, what we did is we took a portion of the actual warehouse space and we took a portion of the parking lot and converted it into its own test track. And so our philosophy is to really get underneath the hood and test the entire AV ecosystem. And so for us, we really want to understand how the vehicle interacts with passengers, the infrastructure, the ITS devices. And so we do a slew of things as it relates to all the smart city stuff. We're really into the testing the actual autonomous vehicles. In fact, the JTA has tested now a total of eight different vehicles across five platforms. We've tested the Easy Mile, the Navia, the Local Motors Ali 2.0, um, the, the, uh, uh, the Polaris Gem, as well as the Green Power EV Star. And so we've, we've tested the gamut of these vehicles in several versions of, of some of them uh, on, on multiple, uh, multiple occasions. And so for us, it was really about how to get that started. And so the first thing that, that we did is now almost you know, three, three or four years ago now is we issued via memo what we call the Golden 20. The Golden 20 is the 20 critical guidelines that we put out to the AV industry, to the tech stack manufacturers and to the OEMs as the 20 critical things that you absolutely need for public transit and public consumption of your vehicle. And so now, so I, I, you know, at the time, I can, I can definitely tell you, I did not know that this was going to become kind of a national document, but it's really become, um, you know, kind of the, 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 the litmus test uh, for, these, for these companies to really measure themselves against to the point that you know, now re recently, as part of our project, we had two large auto parts manufacturers leverage and work with us, um, take the requirements, use the Golden 20, and are now proposing two potential prototypes uh, that, that the JTA has not yet chosen, but are potentials for the, the first JTA project. Uh, but some of the Golden 20 requirements are very selfishly written. For example, you'll see things in there that says like the autonomous vehicle needs to operate at a 10 to 12 percent grade. Why? Because we 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 foresee the 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 need for uh, for the AV to have to go up and down a ramp. Um, and so we, we we do that work. But for us, it was really about imagining what these AVs look like going up and down Bay Street. And as a result, 
we were the first also to create our own test protocol. So bringing that knowledge in-house, uh, we wrote these test plans, we wrote these test protocols, and then started really testing these vehicles, looking at how they performed, the batteries, fully loading them. Uh, we were the first, if you're looking at the video here, to also purchase the Green Power EV Star, which is a full FMVSS, Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard vehicle that is street legal, that we put an autonomous kit on. Um, we have a partnership with the Florida State College of Jacksonville, where we use the test track because I couldn't wait for SunTracks, uh, which is the government uh, state larger uh, AV dedicated technology space here in Florida. But at the time, it wasn't fully built out four or five years ago. And so we went to FSCJ and really put infrastructure out there where we do more iterative testing. And that led to what you see here, which is the Goodyear Corporation called me and said, look, you know, we'd like you guys to be the test bed for our first airless, um, our first non-pneumatic tire designed for, for autonomous shuttles. And so those tires were exclusively launched and tested here at the JTA in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, both high-speed testing on the larger test track as, as well as the more iterative testing. So for us, it's really been about, you know, getting under the hood, looking at what the, these vehicles can do. That allowed us to really, it, it, like, put all that stuff, inject all that stuff into our procurement document uh, so, that, so that they would know what we really um, need and what we're looking at. And so, you know, inside our facility in the lower right, we also, you know, we also have capabilities uh, indoor. And so we've cleaned the place up a little bit. And, and even though you see all those tapes and squares on the floor, it is actually mirroring a four-way intersection indoors. I share that with you because one of the things that we're doing and started doing, uh, we just uh, completed installation of all the equipment, is we are testing indoor localization. Uh, one of the things that we'd like to see happen is that these vehicles seamlessly drive from outside to indoors. Why? We have stakeholders along our route, particularly the Museum of Science and History, uh, particularly with the work that we've done with Mayo Clinic, where they said, we'd like to see these vehicles drop off passengers inside the lobby right at the elevator. Again, no emissions, all electric. It just makes sense, particularly on the smaller form factors. You can really make that happen. You know, some of the other work we've done is on our test track, we've installed all the, 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 the traffic cabinets. We have NEMA 3, NEMA 6 cabinets, the traffic lights, the analytic cameras, LIDARs, radars, the pedestrian crossing, and as well as flood sensors. All of that technology is at our test track, um, and we test the gamut along these vehicles. We even took it a step further, and I, I directed the team, and we built our own Rainmaker, right? Um, we have huge tanks connected to a pump, and we actually do a simulated rain tunnel, and we simulate torrential downpours. Why? Because in Florida, we actually have torrential downpours for about 15 minutes, and then it's bright sunshine again. And so you can't, I can't tell the CEO I'm going to shut down a, a transportation system because of a torrential downpour. So again, our test protocol, a lot of it is somewhat selfishly written. So for example, you won't see a test for how the vehicle performs in snow because we never see snow here in Jacksonville, Florida. Hence, you know, we do have a torrential downpour test where we actually do a simulated rain tunnel um, to see what the vehicles, uh, how the vehicles perform. And so that was phenomenal because a lot of the OEMs got feedback on how the vehicle really stuttered or stopped. Um, as you all know, LIDAR being the primary sensing technology uses lasers and lasers refracts off of water. And so that's, that's really an issue. Um, you know, last I'll say about the test and learn is Mr. Ford also charged us to be very, um, um, you know, to really lean in on just the innovation and stuff that, you know, I guess the automation innovation division does. It's not just about AVs. And so we started looking at how to implement simple innovations and in technologies, some things that even benefit safety. So here on that upper right image, what you're seeing there is a 3D crosswalk. Uh, we literally painted it with a local artist. Um, the further you are away, it looks like floating bollards. And so the reaction to the naked eye and to the driver as far away is they naturally tap on their brakes, wanting to slow down. And as soon as you get closer, it actually flattens out. Now, I will tell you, uh, uh, DOT is not necessarily in favor, likes me for this. Um, it is not in the MUTCD. Um, you know, they're, they're still working, working through that. But we see this as really a, a unique innovation. Why? Many of you might not know this, but Jacksonville was at least in the top 10 of pedestrian fatality cities for a number of years. 
Um, and I think still is. And so one of the things we always look at is how to really control and help out things that, at the intersection. Um, one of the things you might, you all might not know is the JT has a unique pedigree also because we're one of um, five or six trans transportation authorities and transit agencies across the country that not just operates its own buses and fleet, but we build roads and bridges. And so most of the bridges and roads throughout the city of Jacksonville were built by the JTA. Now we built them and turned them over to municipalities. But what that means is when we come in, we are doing a complete street approach. We're, we're, we're building, we're not just putting in a bus stop. We're building your sidewalks. We're looking at your intersection. We're making that ADA compliant. We are doing a complete street approach. And a lot of our projects are literally road projects. And so we have an extensive capital projects and system development team here. And so, you know, that gives us a unique pedigree in terms of the things that we want to do. So that's what the test and learn was about. And that's why we did it. And so we, we took that even further. Uh, and I think you all, like, like all of us, went through this, this, this COVID pandemic. And, you know, when everything came to a screeching halt, we basically said, well, wait a minute, you know, how do we lean any and, and further? And I remember making a call to a couple, uh, you know, contacts at Mayo Clinic uh, on a Saturday night and to, uh, you know, some of our other partners at BEEP and Navia at the time. And we basically launched the, the first full level four, right, implementation of the Navia Autonome Shuttle in the United States by really bringing those four shuttles and, and getting permission from NHTSA to fully remove the safety driver on board. And so these vehicles were operated during the pandemic um, and allowing, and we did this for four months straight, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. and allow these vehicles to move all of the COVID-19 test samples from the test tents. If you remember at the, at the height of COVID, we had test tents everywhere, drive-through test tents, but the laboratory was on the other side, was, was, was about a quarter mile uh, away. And so to, to release resources, we allowed these vehicles to just operate with special permission from Mayo Clinic on their campus, where it would just be shuttling you know, the person would just come downstairs, load the container, and just hit the button, let the AV go. And the AV would just shuttle back and forth all, all day long. Um, we moved over 30,000 COVID-19 test samples over four months with zero safety incidences. In fact, what I would share with you is Mayo Clinic, after we left their campus, called me back and said, we just realized during the four months you were here, we actually had no pedestrian and vehicular uh, incidents on campus. They actually had improved safety because all of traffic ended up indexing itself to the speed of the AV, which was, you know, the, the most of the speed limit, which is 15 miles an hour. And so, you know, it, it just is a true testament to what this technology can mean. It's not just about moving people. It really represents so much more. And this project won the JTA, the ITS World Congress Award in Germany for all of the Americas two years ago. And then our partners beat won that same ITS World Congress Award last year. And so again, the complete vision of the JTA is how you start out with this two and a half mile system in orange and really spread those tentacles. The vision is for us to, to really accomplish this entire 10 plus mile system right, that will use autonomous vehicle and interconnect all the, these various neighborhoods through the downtown core. And so uh, there's a lot more that we can talk about, um, about the JTA, but I guess, you, you know, what I leave you with is that the JTA is way more than just your normal transportation agency, right? As you can see, uh, as I mentioned to you, we build roads and bridges. We operate in a space where we are trying to really leverage innovation and technology to the benefit of public transit and to the benefit of, of our constituents and customers. And so it doesn't take away that there are challenges. Uh, I certainly um, will take some questions and, 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 and I think there might be some conversations and questions about you know, real challenges towards level four automation, what that means um, and what we're doing about that. I have some slides on that as well. And also some of just the natural challenges that are with EV and others. But, Overall here, what I'm sharing with you is, this is how we've been able to lean in um, in everything that we do. And this is how this project has come together and got us worldwide recognition 
to the point now where that first phase of the project is underway we will, and, and it's set to start full service in 2025. So I'll take a pause here and um, welcome any questions um, you and your team Alvaro might have. 